A number of years ago, I was having a conversation on the parking lot of my parish church, my home church, with a fellow parishioner. In the context of this, we were discussing how I was getting ready to go to seminary for the first time and to really experience what it was like. But what shocked me and what actually made that conversation stick out in my mind was what the parishioner's response was to me saying that I was going to the seminary. He responded whenever he heard this news, he said, isn't there anything else you can do with your life? Why would you want to do that? And I was rather shocked and bewildered because I had gone through so many months of discernment. I had weighed the pros and the cons. I had said yes and no. I tried to figure out what exactly God wanted from me at that point in time. And I finally thought I had arrived at my decision. And I thought I would get all the support, even from this parishioner. And instead, I got that question. Are you sure that's really what you want to do with your life? And we get so used to all these different ministers in our midst. We hear about prophets, priests, we hear about the apostles, we hear about bishops, and so many other ministers, whether so long ago in, in our day and age, that they're called, they're commissioned, they're given a certain mission by God to go forward and to speak the gospel. But what exactly does that mean? Why does that change life for us, even if we feel like we're amongst the common? What exactly is this encouraging and challenging us to do, even in our own day and age? To begin, we start off with the first reading that came from the book of the prophet Amos. And this is an encounter between Amaziah and Amos. We hear about this dialogue. And we might expect, since they're doing similar missions and working with similar people, that they would be very friendly and amicable towards one another. But it's quite the opposite. Because we see Amaziah, what's he saying to Amos when he encounters him? Off you visionary, flee to the land of Judah. Right away, he starts calling names. We see that there is this envy, there's this professional jealousy. He's not sure what to do with Amos, and he wants him to go away. And he says further, there, earn your bread by prophesying. And we might think that this is an indictment against Amos, but it actually tells us something about Amaziah. That he's telling us that all he's, he's just simply doing his own job as a sort of earning bread, as a way to make ends meet. But he expects Amos to do the exact same. But he's trying to get him out of the way. He's trying to remove him from his midst so that he can simply just do what he's always done. But listen to Amos' response. Now, Amos doesn't get angry. He doesn't get upset or jealous or he doesn't start yelling in his face. But he starts saying something very simple. He says, I was, amongst, I was not of a noble lineage. I was not of a prestigious heritage. But instead, I was just a simple shepherd, a dresser of sycamores. And then the Lord came to me, and he called me out from the flock, and he told me, go and prophesy to my people Israel. It's a brilliant response, because it tells us Amos isn't in this for himself. He, in all humility, he would have been just fine living life as he was doing, and yet the Lord called him up from the little league, so to speak, and he sent him to go and do great things. And it's also a way of encountering Amaziah as well. Because Amaziah, we can presume, was not doing his ministry all that effectively at that time. The people were still crying out, asking for more, asking to hear the Lord's kindness and of his salvation, as the response of Psalm reminds us. Amaziah wasn't going to do his job, so Amos was coming up instead, that the Lord sent someone still to be his messenger and his minister. We move on to the second reading and hear that we've just transitioned, that we're moving away from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and we're moving instead into his letter to the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus. And we tell that this is a beautiful Pauline letter because of the structure that is there. He starts off at the very beginning with this benediction, with this blessing, with announcing the one on whose behalf he is approaching the church in Ephesus. So he starts saying how blessed is God, blessed is the one who sent Jesus Christ, and gives us every spiritual blessing under the heavens. And he starts to tell us why that matters. Because he tells that in Jesus that all are chosen, that all are able to experience redemption, the forgiveness of sins, that it is through him and through his own unblemished state that all are able to call upon their God and enjoy adoption as his sons and daughters. And so it's a very lavish way to start a letter, but it's a beautiful one nonetheless because it tells about God who has done all sorts of great things, about the one in whose name Paul approaches the Ephesians. But he doesn't just stop there. And we could have stopped there with the reading, but it actually goes on because it tells that we are also chosen. 
Because Paul doesn't want them to be confused. He doesn't want them to get this idea that because of their chosenness, because of their election in Christ, they can simply enjoy that. They can be baptized and then go do as they want. But he says that they're chosen for a particular purpose in accord with God's will. What does that mean? Every single person has a deliberate part in God's plan. Every person is chosen for a specific role. Every person has something to do in furthering and building up the kingdom of God. And so he wants them to tell us that they are elected, they are chosen in Christ, yes, as the body of Christ. But now they're being sent. They have a particular purpose. They have a goal. They have a mission in mind that they should go and accomplish. And that is what St. Paul's reminding them. And they do all of this why? For the glory of God, so that he may be manifest to every land, every nation, and every person within each of those. And then finally, we move on to the gospel, and we hear about Jesus. He's commissioning the twelve, and he's sending them out two by two. And as he does this, he gives them a simple set of instructions. He tells them to go their way, and to take no food, no money sack, to take no other extra provisions. And this tells us something important about their ministry, that they are, in fact, going to rely on the Lord's providence. They need not rely on themselves. They need not rely on their own idea of things, but rather they're going to continue to rely upon the Spirit. And so they go forward just taking a few different things. They take a walking stick. They take sandals. And this tells us, too, the journey is not expected to be easy. It's expected to be arduous that they're going to have to go all over the place proclaiming the gospel of God. This isn't just them going out into their backyard and saying something gentle, but it's them going forward to every land and place and telling what, the other, what others need to hear. And then we move on, and Jesus starts to tell them to go into these homes, and if they find that they are not accepted, to simply shake their dust off their feet in testimony against those others. They aren't really supposed to focus on the way that they feel that they are experiencing success or failure. That ultimately, if they find that they are not welcome, if their message is not being heard, Jesus tells them, move on, shake the dust off your feet and go to the next place because the time is so short in which we have to do all of these great things. And so they're simply to go forward, to preach the message faithfully and to go along. That if they're accepted, great. If they're not, they move on. That they continue to preach the gospel nonetheless. And the gospel, it tells us that they were faithful, that they went forward and they spoke that message, that they preached the gospel of repentance, and then they went forward. They drove out many demons, and then they anointed with oil those who were sick. And what happened? They cured them. What a powerful testimony of faith. That these 12 apostles, they're sent forward, that they're going out two by two. They're doing all of these great things. They're faithful to the Lord. And because of that, they enjoy great benefit and success. And we're told that they preached the gospel, they drove out demons, and then they even enjoyed the benefit of knowing that the sick that they anointed were cured. What a powerful thing. And we might even look at that, and we might long for that. And in some sense, we do experience that in, even in our own day and age. But we wonder, wouldn't it be great to be like the apostles? To be able to go forward, to preach the gospel, to experience the effect of being able to drive out demons, and even being able to cure the sick. Wouldn't that be marvelous in our own day and age? The reason that all of these readings and this gospel are presented to us today is not for us to marvel at the past, but for us to look into the future and to wonder about our own role in salvation history, that we too have a role to play in bringing about the kingdom of God. And in this is the first point we should take away from this gospel. Namely, each of us have a commission. Each of us have a part to play in God's bringing about the gospel message, in preaching, in teaching others about the good news, and even in healing our world today and in this day and age. Each of us have a role to play. The none of us are taken away from that message and mission, but each of us have a particular part. And we should be aware of that. Because it's all too easy to feel that there's just a few elect ministers that are able to do things, perhaps priests, maybe deacons, and especially bishops, that all of those are even the consecrated and religious. They are the ones that are the forerunners. They're the, the elect few that are chosen to do something in our day and age. Perhaps it's just reserved to them. But it's not. If anything, this gospel, even though it uses the apostles, it tells us that all of us should be thinking about where our mission is, where we are supposed to work, where we are supposed to preach the gospel at all times and in every way. 
that none of us are removed from that obligation. Each of us have a role to play. But then we might ask ourselves another question. If this is the case, why? Why do I have to preach the gospel? Why do I have to be the one to go forward? Why do I have to break with my life of comfort so that others can hear the gospel message? My brothers and sisters, we don't have to look very far. We might get it in our mind that we don't live in the same time as the apostles, that we might feel like we're not looking around at sick lying in the streets per se, that we're not experiencing large demonic possessions or large-scale anything of that nature or any sort of evil affliction, or we might even not necessarily think that we need to preach the gospel of repentance any longer. My brothers and sisters, we don't have to look much further than even yesterday in the occurrences of that to understand we're in a broken world. We're in a very hurt world. We're in a divided world. We're in a world that is so afflicted that evil itself is being labeled as good. And people are wondering and trying to continue to say that those things are acceptable and okay. We live in a world that is hurting. We live in a world that is ill, that needs the presence of God, that needs Jesus Christ now more than ever before, that needs our bold and courageous witness now more than ever before. None of us are removed from this mission. None of us do not have a role in what the preaching of the gospel message is supposed to look like. Each and every one of us should be doing this. If we want to ask ourselves why, we just have to look around. The world needs this message. The world needs the gospel, and it needs it proclaimed loudly and boldly. Because for, a long, for far too long, it has gone unproclaimed. That the gospel has gone unheard. That so many people have sat back and relaxed because they felt that the gospel and proclaiming the gospel, it was for someone else. And it's not just, um, it's not just those of the faithful that have rested easy. Oftentimes, it's even members of the clergy that have rested as well. But we know the gospel needs to be proclaimed now more than ever before. We live in a world of many ills. We live in a world that is filled with all sorts of demons per se, whether it's personal struggles or otherwise. That we live in a world that is maybe not necessarily struggling with physical illness, but instead is struggling with emotional illness and even spiritual illness as well. And we know the spirit that is going to heal everything, and that is the spirit of truth. That is the one that God gives to us. That is the message of Jesus Christ who came, suffered, and died and so that we might live. And we have that truth, but we need to proclaim it to others. And that's the why. Because each of us are chosen. Each of us have a role. Each of us have a part. Each of us have friends, have family members, have online acquaintances, and all sorts of places that we can proclaim the gospel, even if just by our good example. And that is why we do it. Because we live in a world that needs to hear that message. And God has given to us, and each and every one of us, a particular part, an irreplaceable part, a part that is destined for us from the beginning of time to play in proclaiming the gospel and in preaching it effectively. But there might be another sort of way that we might object to this. There might be a way that we feel that we are inadequate, and that might be that we feel we have nothing to say. We have nothing to add. We don't feel that we have the prestige. We don't have the eloquence to preach the gospel. If the first reading tells us anything, it tells us we don't have to have eloquence. We don't have to have prestige. We don't have to have this divine pedigree to be able to speak the gospel and to preach it effectively. We just need to have one thing, fidelity. Because look at what Amos did. He came from very humble beginnings. He came from the life of a shepherd and a dresser of sycamores, the most humble of all beginnings. And God made something great of him. And that should be our way of life as well. We need not worry about whether or not we have it. We need not even worry about our own brokenness, our own woundedness, our own affliction, our own struggle with sin. That certainly will persist, and we will always be working with those things and trying to better ourselves. But that should never preclude us from proclaiming the gospel. Because we might feel we are weak. We might feel like we have nothing to say. We might not even feel like we have an adequate audience to proclaim the gospel to. But we're not called to assess those things. We're not even called to assess whether we think we'll be successful. God only calls us to be faithful. And that is exactly why Amos responded. Amos responded because the Lord said, Go and prophesy to my people Israel. He didn't start to wonder, do I have enough? Am I able to do what, it, what he is asking? Do I have what it takes? 
Amos didn't ask those questions. The apostles didn't ask those questions. They didn't ask Jesus, are you sure we're ready? They just simply went out and did it. They prophesied. They spoke of the gospel message. They went out. They drove out demons. They cured the sick. They did so many wonderful things. My brothers and sisters, if we're faithful, how many wonderful things do you think we can do? How many th different illnesses do you think we could cure, whether spiritually, emotional, or whether we simply start to heal division within our own land? How many different ways do you think we can drive out the demons of sinfulness and of evil within our own way and within our own world? How many different things do you think we could accomplish if we but be faithful? The Lord doesn't call us to start to wonder if we'll be successful. He doesn't call us to assess those things. The simple reality is he calls us because he knows we can effect change. We can do things for the sake of the gospel. And we can do things that matter or meaningful and ultimately will change the face of the earth. The Lord doesn't call us to assess those things. He's already done that. The only thing he calls us to do is to be faithful. Why was I so stunned by that conversation in the parking lot so long ago? Why does it still stick out in my mind today? I think it's because that parishioner thought I had an option. I had a choice. That I could do whatever I wanted. That I could go out and pave my own way into the world. But the thing was, in my own mind, in my heart of hearts, I knew there's only one way. It's God's way. There's only one choice. It's God's choice. There's only one mission, and it's the fact that I have been commissioned by God and sent forward to proclaim the gospel. And that was the only option in my mind, and there was no other. And so it should be with each of us, my brothers and sisters. It's not just to an elect few that preach the gospel, and it's not just a job reserved for the elite. It's for each and every one of us in our own unique way, in our own unique circumstances, and with our own unique groups, with our friends and families. Each and every one of us are called to proclaim the gospel. And no matter where the venue is, no matter what it is, we don't need to wonder if we'll be successful. We don't need to worry about being ostracized. We don't need to worry about being rejected. Jesus tells us just simply shake the dust off your feet and move on. That, in fact, is what he's telling us. Not to assess whether we think we'll be successful. Not to assess whether we think we have anything of value to say. Not to assess whether we think that we are the perfect tool or instrument for God to use. If we're baptized, we're chosen, and that's enough. My brothers and sisters, each of us have a role to play in bringing about the kingdom of God and bringing healing to our land and to our world and even to our own nation. Each of us have a role to play in bringing about the gospel, in bringing about the truth, in bringing about the peace that only Christ can provide. None of us are exempt from that. It is up to us to be faithful, to follow the ways, and to seek out God's will for our life so that we can find the way that we are called to proclaim the gospel in every way that we can, in every place, in every time, no matter where the Lord sends us. Perhaps that's why that conversation is still rings true to me today. It's not an option. Every one of us have a way to go. Each of us have an allotment of where we are supposed to proclaim the gospel. The only choice is to be faithful and to follow wherever the Lord leads. So I'll leave with a simple question. The Lord has given each of us a commission. Each of us have a job to do in furthering the kingdom of God. Do we have the courage to do what it takes, even in our own day and time, to be faithful as Amos and the apostles were?